that's an investment in technology that in the, you know, in a moment where I have to make choices around having less, that's a way for me to continue to operate at a similar level, but not necessarily carry all the same cost loads. So what are your thoughts on this topic? Like res recession proofing your business? What is a, what does a business do? And I, I know we always take the technology, technology spin, right? We're in technology, but what, how am I prepping to, for the impending doom? If you look at the, uh, the organizations that, I mean, we, this is probably unique in the sense that when was the last time we went through a, an economic contraction? I won't use the R word. It wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. It was early 2020. Yeah. And it was based on a very unique event that occurred. But this is probably the shortest period of time we've had between, <clears throat> again, assuming things. We don't know the future, but there's a lot of predictions coming. <clears throat> this would potentially be the really short period of time between two contractions. If you look at what a lot of businesses maybe did or didn't do during that time. If I look at what we did, uh, one, a great area of savings for us was in something that has nothing to do with people, has nothing to do with the line of business applications. It's an area of spend that businesses don't think about, which for us was connectivity. And it's a lot of times it's an audit that you go and you just identify what is everything you're spending. I don't know that a lot of businesses have that business intelligence to understand where are all the dollars going that get categorized with IT? There's that G&A budget line item. Sometimes it's a single line sure. on the budget, and you have to get intelligence there. Sometimes there's low-hanging fruit. Uh, I don't know that the COVID one counts, though. I was going to – I had a similar thought, right, is that was such an artificial change in yeah. you, know, an, you know, a macroeconomic reality. Arguably, the last – you know, big downturn was a long time ago. Yeah. Right. 15 ish years ago. You're talking about 2008, 2008. 2008 yeah. Right. And, you know, that was the, the most recent prolonged. I mean, the COVID one was so short and, and, you know, driven by these weird We shut the world forces. down. Right. Right. I mean, it, right. It, it, we just hit pause yeah. basically. Um, but sure. there was tons of demand and, and strength in the economy in 2020. Um, so really, it's been a long time since we've been through these. And the reality is, these are normal, healthy uh, ebbs and flows in the economy, right? Yeah. When times are good and you invest and invest and invest, not everything was a good investment. Yeah. Right? It's the reset period. It's the it reset, lets, right? Yeah. Things get evaluated and put through another lens. And, we, you know, people ultimately make choices. Let's pull back in one area or another. Let's regroup our troops, so to speak. So everyone always gets scared in these moments, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. But I also think we have to be true to ourselves in the reality that this is also a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. I Patrick, you, you had an you sparked another thought that we when when these situations happen, I don't get the feeling that people are thinking about investments or thinking about the put line it's always the the take line or just this is my impression it's when the economy slows it creates a stasis and that's part of actually what compounds recessions is the the movie the money stops moving as quickly the the flow of money is one of the best indicators of economic well-being and the trajectory of the economy and so that trickle down effect actually i feel like it kind of almost infects our minds a little bit that we're like, oh yeah, change, no change, no change, right? Too risky. And we just kind of, we as a society, we as buyers, we as leaders, we as employees, everybody just kind of takes a pause and settles down a little bit. And so it's harder to make the the investments that you're talking about or, or con to connectivity, for example, which might not be a, a cost at all. Like in many cases, these investments might be a savings. They might be uh, no cost at all. They might be something that doesn't require a financial investment, but they might require a time investment. Yet we're still unwilling to make a lot of them because everything's slow. We're in frozen mode. It leads me to a question I was going to ask. From your perspective, Luca, are, is there more flexibility to do some things now, to make some investments now in advance of this that – 
are potentially are not drastic. I don't want to say irreversible, but is there more flexibility? Are the skids a little bit more grease now to do more of that, to do more of the puts so that if you have to do any takes later, you have the benefit of those puts and it has a couple of months to bake. Yeah, I mean, for us, by the nature of the way our business works, I think we're able to think that way a bit more than maybe others, other organizations. You know, you always hear about some businesses are are really impacted by a down economic downturn. Other businesses are actually benefited by economic downturn. I think we're in in a weird place or or maybe a more unique place where there can be downside, but there can also be upside for us, right? As an as an outsourcer, which is, at a most generic sense, that's what we do. A lot of times we would be something that organizations would lean into in a, in a moment like this. So can we make bets right now? We certainly can. Can organizations that are more negatively impacted, maybe they have less flexibility to do that. So I think it's it depends on the industry you're in and, and how... If you, you know, you got to look in the past history to see, have some predictors for what the future looks like. Right. And so you really need to, to know who you are, who your organization is and how this likely plays out for you to be able to play those chess moves and, and where to put those pieces on the board. Y'all, y'all are approaching this from the, the true supply demand side of like, if I just don't have resources, I can't invest in anything. I get that. Right it's a lot of it comes down to am i willing to take any risk whatsoever well i think you have to I, there's this I, I would have to go and look look up the data behind this but there is this concept between being in a moment like this being an early mover right making the changes whatever those might be and being out in front of the curve, the, the organizations that do that on the average are going to perform better than those that wait and delay making harder decisions. And this is, goes back to where I started saying, you got a plan, you got to know what your plan is and know when you execute on that plan. That's the big thing here, right? Is if you know what you're going to do when something happens, you know, to you can be that early mover. But if you're making those plans when it's already happening, you might not be able to be in that early mover position anymore. Right now you're in the middle of the pack or later in the pack. And the data just shows that those organizations are going to not fare as well as those that act earlier. Yeah, I'm trying to find the research on it. I'm, I'm not moving as fast as I like, but what you're describing, and as soon as you started talking, I, I was thinking back to my uh, game theory coursework. It's the first mover's advantage, right? I never actually thought about this applying in recession times, right? Well, think, think about it from this perspective, right? If cash, right? Cash is an important piece sure. of being able to run a business. If you're burning cash longer, right? You're on your heels. Yeah. Versus if you put yourself in a position to be in a, in a cash strength position and you can make changes and, and navigate the market you know, at, at a very macro level, I'm, I'm talking, if you can navigate that market moment or moments over quarters, right? However many quarters you give yourself options and having optionality is, is power, right? Yeah. Because the opportunities may not present itself until some period down the road, but if you're cash constrained, even when you see the opportunity, you might not be able to capitalize on it. I mean, that's what, I, I think that's what uh, a direction I'd like to take this for a moment is what are some specific things organizations can do to prepare themselves to be opportunistic? I think number one is cash, as you said. Having a plan is number two. How can an entire organization be prepared for that? I think a lot of times the, the leadership team builds that plan. There's some things to do to start stockpiling cash yeah. to provide that optionality. How can you provide that level of flexibility or that ability to be nimble throughout an entire organization. So broad topic, broad question. Let's try to bring it to a segment that you can point at that you could have a conversation about. So look at startups, right? Startups generally are operating in a cash burn mm -hmm. type of situation. Yeah, right? almost all of them are negative. And especially right now with rates changing, with just, you know, investors pulling back and, and the, 
and the limited partners maybe not putting in money the way they once were raises the next raise for organizations, which has only ever gotten bigger and bigger and bigger for the last 15 years, easy, easy to raise, you know, basically you, the startup set the terms that world's done and over. Yeah. Right. And when Lucas says raise, he's talking about funding rounds. Yeah. You like mean raising, cap money. raising capital. That's right. And so organizations typically, they look at their cash burn, they look at when they're going to do their raises, et cetera. So that whole dynamic's changing. Well, now I, as a startup, not that that's not who we are, but speaking about that segment, you know, startups now have to look at how do I lower my burn rate to predict what their raises are likely to look like? Because instead of raising a hundred million in cash, they might get 15 next time. Yeah, you're talking about mm. substantial valuation dips. And, and I don't think, I think intellectually, a lot of CEOs of these kinds of organizations know this, but are they really making the changes in their businesses today so that they can elongate that run that runway that they need? And this is where the first mover's advantage comes in. And back if you're the... early in doing that and you get to where you need to be based on a very new reality, that's that first mover's advantage. Now, if you don't, take that bitter pill and it is one, right? It's going to hurt. Um, you know, especially when the next raise is likely a down round, you don't have choices, right? You all of a sudden have to take the deal that's put in front of you mm -hmm. that maybe isn't very good because you didn't clean up the cash burn. You didn't get healthy financially. And so this, I, I use that because it's an extreme and it's easy to talk about, Yeah. but every industry, every organization needs to be thinking about how do I make sure I'm preserving cash? And that's different for a lot of folks, right? For, for an organization who's really capital equ equipment heavy, that means something different than an organization that's really human capital intensive, right? So to, what to do depends on the kind of organization you are. I mean, that's... <sighs> It's interesting to think about the nature of this particular pending contraction, economic contraction, recession, whatever you want to call it, that the difference here is it's going to potentially come with interest rates that are at unfamiliar levels that any of us have seen in 15 years or possibly longer. My whole life. Right. Possibly you mean the, our whole life. How high they are. How high yeah. they're, they are. The and interest potentially rates have will never get. reached this in my lifetime. Right. I mean, so you're going to see interest rates getting to a point where the availability to borrow cash will be at a level that's uncomfortable for just about every business out there. Going back to, I think, this, this statement around preserving cash being a driver of optionality uh not just to survive through what the, whatever the duration of the downturn is but the nature of every recession is how can you be opportunistic on the back end if you can survive it's those that become strong are the ones that have the opportunity near the tail end to be a first mover back out as yeah. it starts climbing yeah i mean look this is it is going to be a unique moment in time from the standpoint that typically in most downturns that we have gone through, what happens macro, right? The Fed typically is going to lower rates to incentivize more investment and get that economy juiced and moving in an upward trajectory, right? We're not in that moment. We're in the exact opposite. Well, they intentionally it's because they took pulling an the extreme break. during the the right. COVID we're, scenario we're, to force we as it. a country and and really the world yeah. are taking a a pill to solve what we did during the pandemic. Yeah, right? right. So in this moment, what when we normally would have a, a fiscal policy of of reducing rates and driving investment, we're doing the exact opposite. Like at quantitative the easing was the term they've used for years. Right. So to your question and to your point, right. So if you can come out the other side of that and that this could by the way be a longer moment of 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 lower activity than traditionally like a lot of times recessions are nine to 18 months this could be 18 months to three years who knows but to your point coming on the other side of that if you are well capitalized there is going to be deals to be had. There's going to be buying opportunities for other organizations that maybe weren't. There's growth and expansion through acquisitions and mergers. Like there's a lot that could happen mm -hmm. for those that come out strong the other side. There's a, maybe it's something that doesn't need to be said, but it, but it's an interesting 
thing that I thought about regarding first mover's advantage. First mover's advantage is not a guarantee of success, right? All the risks of making a move still exist. And I think sometimes that that quick reaction is something we got to be cautious of because each move that we make during this time period is so incredibly impactful. Like there's the, the, the range of positive and negative becomes much wider. And to make a move, we've really got to think through what are the implications of that move? Because to your point about funding rounds, Luca, maybe I make a move now and I get money while it's good. But if I have to take a second or a third or a fourth down round, my business is now valued at a lower amount. Like it's done. Yeah. There's, there's no way to overcome that new precedent that's been set versus if I only have to take one down round. Whoa, well, that was the economy, right? Moving first doesn't guarantee an outcome mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but a lot of times I've, I've operated in the philosophy of doing nothing is is probably not a good thing we're not moving yeah, forward exactly i can make the wrong decision and then course correct mm -hmm. on the next one and the next one to me and and it proves out often in the data it isn't a guarantee but it is an indicator of the likeliness mm -hmm. i gotta say something just to break us up real fast uh my stomach's going through a recession right now and our team just brought in they a brought bunch of really food. good smelling food yeah. and they're all eating it while we're doing this <laughs> And it's the most insensitive thing. And now they're all laughing like, oh, uh, but savages. They're, they are first movers. Yeah. They're jumping into the, the spicy chicken. True. That's wild. That's so, wild. Well, expand, though, beyond startups. So, I mean, down rounds, that's specific to a startup. This idea of changing your valuation, being able to borrow. May, uh, take this to worst service economy. Yeah. Right? America at least as a country, is primarily a service economy. I can't remember the exact number, but it's almost staggering mm -hmm. how little product is manufactured. And by be being a service economy, it's really about how you retain staff members mm -hmm. and how you can continue to invest those staff members in providing that service or developing whatever the product is that's delivered by people. How do you think about a, a world that where your product is your people, whether it's I mean, healthcare is like that. Your physicians, your nurses, those people are your product. What they bring to the table is the product. Legal is the same way. Accounting is the same way. Uh, and home services are the same way. Your HVAC technician, your painters, your roofers. In this service economy, what types of options do you have? Especially if you are able to conserve some cash. Well, I think it's a whole topic in and of itself, but creating an environment where people want to be and and being able to retain talent top talent particularly um is you know is critical has been critical certainly in the last couple of years with all the movement that we've seen in in people moving organizations um but there's a whole nother dynamic that i think also is gonna start to hit right now which is We've seen a lot of people leave the workforce. Yes, unemployment rates are low, but when you start pulling people out of the employment pool. Yeah, the pool, labor participation rate's also yeah, down right? substantially. Way down. So that artificially makes unemployment look better. Yeah. <clears throat> if we really, but what's driven that, right? You've seen huge liquidity come into the market. You've seen stimmy checks for people that now I don't need to work, or I've got this side hustle. Now I don't need to have a day job, right? There's all these things that have taken people out crypto, right? Crypto has taken people out of the labor pool as those things pull back and we're going to pull trillions of dollars out of the economy. Mm -hmm. That's going to have an impact to labor. Meanwhile, the cost of goods is rising faster than it ever has. So, yeah, that's a that's right. another element to this. But what likely happens is we see an increase in the available pool of people wanting to work. Yeah, right. Because as those alternative ways of having cash to live start to become less meaningful, people are going to need to work, and so. It's never going to change that doing the right things to be the employer of choice. That is always going to be a constant in, of importance. But I think, you know, as the pendulum has swung in one direction, it's now going to swing likely in another. There's going to be more people that want to work, which is yeah. going to help the labor issues. There's also a... We, 
we studied this when I was at university talking about the U.S. and the transition from an industrial economy to a service economy. And, and one of the things that I think about it when you're talking, Patrick, is that really what that means is we're a net exporter of intellect. Like intelligence is really what we're paying for in, in that service economy. And maybe it's specialist labor, with a plumber, or maybe it's the IT services space, or for some reason y'all have me here. I still can't figure it out. Um, and the reality of what Luca just said, which was interest, interesting because I never put these two together, is creating the environments that foster the most intelligence. And it's important to think about it that way because a lot of research has been done on how to create environments that foster intelligence. A lot of research has been done. And so we can look to that research and say, okay, what aren't we doing right? Maybe the ping pong table is nice, but it's not actually that thing that fosters the intelligence. It's not the thing that allows us to really maximize our growth, our creativity, and how we're leveraging the intellect we have within our labor pool. But we can do these four or five other things, right? And you start to talk about things like rest and quality of life and stress reduction and a lot of things that companies actually do have the ability to influence, which if we're focused on influencing those things in a positive direction, then maybe there can be more outcome. And in some cases, that investment isn't a financial one. And so that's that's one of the ways that organizations can think about when we talk about recession proofing. That is one of the ways that I think we can think about how to structure companies in a way. And frankly, technology plays into that because many of the things I just mentioned go back to our, our talk two talks ago are being influenced by a remote work world where technology is the main mechanism of communication and connecting that we have. So pull that thread a little bit. Okay. If uh, there's been a lot of talk in the news about some relatively large organizations attempting to enforce a return to office policy and then pulling back the throttle relatively yeah, they get quickly on immediately that. decimated and say oh wait we're sorry come back well so pull the so luca you were just talking about that pendulum swinging back the other way do you think organizations do you think the global economy because this is really a it, it's global yeah you talk about being a net exporter i mean this recession whatever it's going to be is likely to be felt globally i think do so. you think the global economy is going to go back to all right now we have we feel like we have a little bit more leverage if you remember that old popular yeah. tv show about nothing they have more hand as they say do they then force a return to office or is there an economic reality of commercial real estate being an expensive sgna item that with technology being where it is today may be an opportunity to preserve some cash There's no absolute answer here. I think it all happens on a gradient. But, you know, for us, we made it a strategic move to lean into mm -hmm. that remote remote world. We started pre-pandemic a very regionalized business that largely hired people somewhere within 50, 60, 70 miles of any of our offices. 75% of our employees pre-pandemic were split between two markets, 50, 50 something percent of those employees were in Atlanta. Right. And so for us over a couple, two, two and a half years, you know, we've, we've put dots all over the country mm -hmm. on the map as far as where this, the team is, because we were able to look at the world differently yep. and say, Hey, I I'm going from a world where I'm hiring the best person within 50 miles of a spot to, I'm just going to hire the best person. Yeah. Um, so for us, that was a strategic decision. I don't see that changing. Comes with its own challenges though. We've Comes had with its own really challenges, but I think, stuff out. but I think ultimately more good than, than, than bad. More of the burden I think has been on us, like the, the eight or nine of us, than the, the, to make it work yeah. and to figure it out for sure. And it isn't easy and it, and it's never perfect. Not, yeah. It isn't perfect you know, the way it was. It isn't perfect the way it has been, but you work through it. Yeah. To your specific question earlier, at a, at a macro sense, do we see uh, corporations pushing to have people back in office? I think the answer is yes. Um, Will they leverage that pendulum swing back towards the employer having a little bit more leverage well, to get of, people back in the think office? Think about it. If I'm right in what I said a minute ago, that you're going to see more people wanting to return to the workforce. And... You know, by the nature of having a larger pool of talent 
you're going to be able to have more choice, right? When there was a restriction on supply that drove, yeah, I'll just say yes to anything, right? That's what the organizations were forced to do. Um, but if, if the supply grows and that demand doesn't change, or maybe even demand goes down because of a, an economic slowdown, yeah, I think there's no question that that pendulum swings back some, if not, you know, similar to where it was. And I don't think it gets back to where it was. Certainly, I think it's it stays somewhere in the, in the middle, but I don't know where on the gradient it ends up. Ironically, uh, now we find the actual new normal. Right. Well, the reason why I think it's interesting, though, is that you have this, you also have the commercial real estate variable that mm -hmm. commercial real estate prices have been increasing double digits, really coming Blew out my of the recession. I, was ne I never expected any of that. And it has not, at least in, in the couple of markets where I've been just keeping up with the rates, yeah. we have not seen a decrease at all as a result of this hybrid workforce think, scenario. Think about why. I haven't you, been able to figure it out. You've got trillions of dollars that have been pumped into the economy. And what if, where has largely that money gone? The markets, the stock market, private companies, et cetera. Sure. Those companies then turn around and, and place bets. They make investments. They grow, right? So while some organizations might have been remote, they still had leases. Those buildings didn't go empty. And they ha many of them probably had a desire to use them again in the future. But also you've got increased demand for space because of those investments organizations were making. So yeah, I'm sure there were folks that went out of business and there was supply that ended office supply that went back on the market or warehouse supply, et cetera. But I mean, come on, Amazon alone added hundred or 200 million square feet yeah. of warehouse in the last two years, just one company, the demand was strong. We had a blip in the economy, but it went crazy up ultimately. And that drives price. What do you guys think is, is, is probably too, too vulnerable of a question. What do you think the direction for us is? Like if we're talking to our teammates, what, what well, are we telling we, them? We've, we, I think are in a, in a fortunate place mm -hmm. that we're seeing even Right now, as, as people are cautious and, and the brakes are starting to be applied in places, demand is strong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, the nature of what we do is often a counter to what's happening in the broader market. So an organization that might be looking to augment or, you know, augment their, their IT talent, we're a good choice for that. And yeah. so I think... Obviously, with the economy being on an upswing, that was good for us. And as organizations are looking for choice, that's also good for us. Um, so I think overall for us, it, it's a it's a positive. Look, the reality is we'll have we'll have some speed bumps too, right? And that's largely dependent on what happens to our customers. Right. If our customers really see a fall off, I, I think back to 08, um, different company doing similar things. I think during the 08 downturn, we lost 25% of our customers. Really? Yeah. Um, now when I, I was in kindergarten then, so I don't know. Yeah, maybe when I look back <laughs> though, <laughs> when I look back at that data, <laughs> who did, who, who was it that we lost? It was typically our smallest customers. Mm -hmm. So by percentage, it was a lot of organizations, but by dollars, it wasn't nearly as, as severe. 08 was lacking one solution that's on the market now, and it's the availability of so many components of IT spend having an OPEX version of what used to be a capital only solution. And in 08, I think that was much more rare. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that potentially... That's interesting. Oh, wait, might have actually created the use case for a lot of that because the timing is right that a lot of companies shifted to op. I, I well, never thought about totally that. different topic. I know. I, think I didn't it's mean more to the market's derail preference us. for recurring and contracted revenue being at a premium for non recurring yeah. revenue. I mean, you think about why the some of the big logos are pushing for this concept of cloud, but it's it does offer a benefit to if a business doesn't have yeah. cash or wants to preserve that cash. 
the ability to not go and spend $3 million on hardware and spend X dollars a month, it may be at a premium and they may recognize that it's at a premium, but that optionality is worth so much more than that premium to come out of the recession. Do you think we see an uptick in consumption of IT spend as a service? Possibly. I mean, to your point, if I'm concerned about conserving cash and I have two choices in front of me and I have to make a decision, I may be choosing the option that doesn't take a big upfront investment, even if I wouldn't typically make that choice. I, I think there are going to be situations where that where that's true. And then those were making that op, OPEX decision was always their mode of operating, probably still do so. Still does so. So, yeah, th that is very possible. Armand, what do you think? From from conversations you and your team are having with prospects, are you seeing any trade winds in that direction yet? I don't... We're uh, first movers on this conversation. I don't think we're the first movers, and the conversation is obviously happening a lot. I think the majority of the content I've heard where it's really being talked about is from the PEVC, like that space where they're generally going to, to Luca's point, they're, they're looking at market trends first. as it, as it relates to things like valuations and they're going to start peeling, pulling back and money was free the last two years. Like it really was, it was legitimately Literally. free. Um, and I, there's a podcast you and I both listen to now. You actually introduced me to it where they were talking about, they were, making deals after 30 minute zoom calls like that's asinine to me to <laughs> no cut a 10 million dollar check no, no no the tech, tech sheet goes out money. and you're done like it's everything right and i i was just listening to that and my mind was blown i was like well shoot i should have come up with an idea during that time period and just kind of hey guys um it's a little bit of could have gotten us some extra cash dot over com here boom there <laughs> yeah no kidding um i don't think we're seeing much if anything with our client conversations yet no yeah uh not, I, not I know we would, will not that would dictate a trend no not nothing like that i i know we will i'm i'm confident in our our value proposition like what our business actually does as it relates to like walking into a recession doesn't scare me all that much i think that from a leadership perspective we're I just know what conversations we have. Uh, and so I'm confident that we can take care of our teammates and our people. And so that's generally where I come from is I'm more worried about the internal aspects of it, but I trust this team. And then on the external side, I just think our business is kind of sound for, it's not recession proof entirely, but for a small client that might go out of business and we need to see if we can help them navigate those waters so that they don't, which are, we've done in the past. So, okay. There's a, there's a different entity that's saying, hey, we can approach this completely differently, save money, and we're that, oh, that cost-saving exercise. And so, so there, there's an opportunity there. So going back to 08 and that comment around 25% of customers yeah. are trading. I remember you telling me y'all got bigger after this. Big time. We, it was one of our best growth cycles was coming out of that. But... In that moment, my typical customer yeah. was 10, 20, 30 employees. That was the si typical size of the organizations. That was walking into 08. That was what your walking into 08. Customer that's what like. our typical customer yep. looked like. Okay. And the reality is, that's the most likely, the smallest organizations are the most likely to go out of business. This data's everywhere. everywhere. It's been around it's a long everywhere. time. For one path, that isn't our typical customer. Yeah, right. That's true. Our our clients are a bit larger, uh, and more established, and I think that bodes well going into what the the relative immediate future will look like. Yeah, because that's a good point. I was thinking about it just from the clients we're getting, right? But for the clients we have, they're there's a sound argument around the maturity of their business, their respective business, and how they're more likely, right? Not guaranteed, but more likely to weather this storm just because they have more resources. I also think if you look at a lot of our, a lot of the clients we've been getting, to your point, mm -hmm. are privately backed. 
<clears throat> equity funds, etc. And an interesting component of this recession that could be looming is you have a record amount of undeployed capital in the private equity space. So that you're can held, be redeployed that can into be prior deployed investments. To be opportunistic, to be a first mover. That's a good point. And being a, a private equity-backed organization right now could potentially be, I mean, again, it depends on the health of your fund, but it could potentially give you a bit of a first mover's advantage if that c capital is already committed at a set rate that was set years ago. Mm -hmm. That's going to be true for sure. Um, limited partners are also not may pull back in what their original commitments were. So just because a fund raises X amount of money, that doesn't mean that all that money was handed over and it's sitting in their piggy bank. Right. right? <laughs> and so I think equity partners are a bit more cautious to go ask for that capital than they might have been in the in in recent past. So whenever I cinch in the belt, it's a little harder to ask for it, more. It, it, everyone, right? And so yes, there are going to be the the good companies, the ones that really should be invested in, they're going to get that investment. It, but it isn't going to be so open, I I think at least. I don't think it is as open as it has been where every company is getting money thrown at it without a lot of well, you know homework being done beforehand. And if you can go and get nine point six two percent i think was the latest stat in a series i treasury bond with zero risk what's the irr hurdle you have to guarantee to those lps it's well, no and, longer and those just 14 percent. maybe you now rates, have to promise 20 or 25 you know maybe the market's already priced in is it really 9.6 percent mm -hmm. it, it is yeah you know the market is probably already priced in the rate movements that just happened and the ones coming in july maybe august Depending on what happens from here, you know, if the Fed continues to move rates, we're going to see more pullback in the markets. We're going to see higher rates in some of the things that that you're referring to. So, it there's a lot of everyone just pausing and watching and waiting to see what happens. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot of that too. So, are you guys personally worried about anything? Sure. I think there's there's plenty to to contemplate and anytime you have a lot of variables that can drive some anxiety. I think there I think it would be foolish to say no. Yeah. Um I'm just worried about staying on his good side because as long as I can be there then, you know. <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day if if you pull back and just say how does this likely play out you know mostly the scenarios are not you know catastrophic they're speed bumps worried maybe is too strong a word but acting more cautiously yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. and maybe it's to put a positive spin on it trying to give some dry powder to be opportunistic if an opportunity presents itself down the road mm-hmm I think the um, this these situations disproportionately affect the people in our, our you know, I'm talking about America, right? That have less resources, right? Just it's so much of a burden, and so well, that's where the inflation topic. If mm -hmm. we really don't stamp it down, oh yeah, it's it disproportionately affects you know those that don't have as as much, right? And so you know, increased grocery prices Met. for some are like, yeah, it sucks. And for some, they're like, I can't eat anymore. Literally. Right. Yeah. Right. And so when you say, what are the things that I'm worried about? Those are the things that I'm worried about because yeah. ultimately it is bad for everyone. Mm -hmm. yes. If, you know, the bottom, whatever percentage is disproportionately affected, that to me is the biggest thing that yeah. is scary. Yeah. I, I agree with that comment. Exactly. What's interesting is that a lot of the signs that you see of that that type of pain being felt, even in um, your your common the the, the quote unquote middle class, however you want to define that, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> just uh, take us to our experience. We traveled together yesterday in the airport. In my lifetime, I have never seen airports this busy. 
I think that'll stop inside of the next three months. That's I really crazy. Do. I I was in a, the Atlanta airport last week. It's I don't know that I've ever seen it that busy. It's mind boggling how it, busy the it was. Are. It was. Well, I mean, you'd be in the terminal and the seat areas were all full. The walkways were just a sea of people. It was packed. I have a and hunch I was, about And I was wondering, though. like, is this a holiday weekend? And it wasn't. And that's, and that's non-discretionary spending. One would argue that for leisure travel, that's, I'm sorry, that's discretionary spending. Mm -hmm. I can't understand how it's still that way, though. I've been buying plane tickets every week, at least several times a month for for the last few years mm -hmm. prices are easily double I, what they were and i don't mean how low they got temporarily yeah. but kind of what normal looked like yeah they're double yep mm -hmm. i don't know how everyone's still a traveling at the rate they are yeah so we, we travel mostly for work reasons we do the sure i have a theory on this one i don't know if it's accurate but i've been wondering the same thing i don't actually think it's that much busier and i what i need to do is go look at the earnings for the major airlines quarter over quarter pre pandemic and now, cause I think it'll be a good indicator of it. Um, I think you have to look at, they have to, I think you have to look at volumes. volume of flights yeah. as well. Because earnings are so skewed right yeah. now with cost structures that's true. changing. Well, and the way I, that I, airlines I, make so much of their money off of the loyalty programs. That's and true. Not like it's volume. Well, you can always break those reports miles. down. Well, essentially what, what I'm getting at. And so you guys are thinking the same thing. It sounds like is, I think there's many less flights and that the supply of flights is making it look like there's an increased demand, but that it's not because you figure Boston, for example, there was a flight out of Atlanta every hour in the past and that doesn't exist anymore. Right. And so those flight schedules being much less is I, I really there do is think a difference, the biggest... difference in schedule. I used to fly out of a, a secondary uh, airport out of the Los Angeles area and there are flights that existed pre-COVID that just never came back, right? Mm -hmm. Those routes are gone. But the major big airports, at least, I think are largely doing what they were doing before. I mean, if I just look at the terminals and how full each one is, maybe on the top and bottom of the day, they're a little different, but in the meat of the day, they sure look as as capacity as they could be. I'm using the parking garages and the volume at the shared ride pickup zones as a barometer and those are as busy as i've ever seen them yeah. so i still think all of that could be uh optics it could Opti be. the optics of less flights being available but capacity Just has less not, potential to move capacity the in the parking lots has not reduced well to your point that could be true if demand's moving from the secondary markets back into the major markets mm -hmm. That's maybe you're right. Too. Maybe that's making the major markets feel different. You got to look. This at... is a total guess. Like this is something that I'll spend, you know, some midnight session uh, with myself. Just oh yeah, let's go nerd out on this airline market and learn something that's never going to provide me any economic benefit. But... Stretch it beyond the airlines. The highways have. I mean, if you remember back to, well, you probably didn't have your driver's license, but 2007, 2008, there was a noticeable decline in traffic on the weekends noticeable decline frankly in commute times in the morning i actually didn't have my driver's license in 2007 <laughs> 2008. <laughs> but there was a noticeable decline and i haven't sensed that either there are more cars it feels like there's more cars on the road maybe outside of this week when it seems somewhat of an anomaly there are more cars on the road yeah <clears throat> and you know what does that mean how many of the businesses that we work with are seeing those same signs that's a good point. Well, we're deep down this rabbit hole, so let, let me see if I can bring us back to the top. The, you know, recession proofing the business is just it's more of a, a game and it's a series of decisions. And really at the end of the day, it's on the leaders at, at every level of the organization to take ownership of protecting the people, making sure that we're driving the types of decisions that will ultimately create longevity within the business, right? That sounds like a theme that we really all kind of attacked for this conversation. Luca, do you have any closing remarks? I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, my last comment, I guess, would be relative to the commentary you just had. I don't think about it like a game, right? I think as leaders, we have great responsibility for the many people and ultimately the families on which we work 
we get the, the pleasure to serve, mm -hmm. right? And so it isn't a cavalier statement. The, to, the word to, game to, is callous in that regard. It, it is. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think we, in order to take care of the whole, the everyone, you have to keep a company healthy. Mm -hmm. And what a healthy company is a financially healthy organization. And so when we talk about how do you do that, and, and a lot of times that's on the cost lines, um, that is, that is something that at least for myself and I know our leadership team, something that is not just a willy nilly decision, right? Um, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that power. And so I think that's the biggest thing that at least for me, for us, I always want to make sure that we have the the greatest good, the greater good for all. Maybe there's an impact to someone or someone's, but it's for the greater whole. I'm I want to make sure that we're taking care of 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 the all, right? And so uh you know, those are hard decisions to make, but that's kind of the angle that I come at it from. Mm -hmm. Patrick, any closing remarks? <clears throat> I think you asked earlier about if there's, am I worried? <clears throat> I think I'd echo Luca's statement. If there's a fear, it's, is there anything we'll find ourselves forced to do that impacts people's lives? And that could be clients or team members. Yeah. There's, there's no way to know I mean, this. We don't know what this is going to look like. I think there's some sort of change coming. We can't see this sort of change in interest rates without there being an effect but what it feels like is I think it's natural to have a fear of the unknown. Yeah. And I guess the way I think about it is we have to be open and honest with ourselves, and with our teammates, share where we're going and why we're going in that direction and why we have to do it. And I think that's, that's create, advice I would give to create anyone. Create your plans, right? right? Yeah. The upside, the base case, the down case. Be thoughtful about it. Yeah. So the, for for my remarks, I'll there's a story Simon Sinek tells that I think really defined me my leadership principles early, and it was about this company in 2008 that was going through a downturn, and they decided that uh, they weren't going to fire anyone, and the CEO made this decision against the board uh, discretion because they effectively needed to save 30 percent or 30 uh, percent of their run rate, their their cogs, or the company was done. There's no way they would make it. Uh, and he went and implemented a mandatory a mandatory furlough program that required every employee to take two weeks of unpaid leave at their own discretion and then made the statement to the entire organization that it's better that every one of us suffer a little than any single one of us suffer a lot. And as a result of that, employees that could afford to take more off actually traded with those who couldn't. And they saved even more money and coming out of the recession, we're able to back pay and 401k match and I'll do all the extra work. And th my point is that this is difficult. There's creative solutions. There's really creative solutions. And we, we bear the responsibility of finding those creative solutions. And I think that's why I, it was a misuse of the word, but why I'm, I think about it in that way. And, and it, it, it really is, it's the hardest thing to do. But it's the burden we all bear and we need to be thoughtful. And so if if organizations take that approach, I think it at least limits the impact that their people feel in the process. So Very good. to the point you made early on, you can't do that on a whim. It yeah. all has to be planned in advance. Yeah, it's it's important. Well, this is our first live stream. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. Like, comment, subscribe, do the thing, do the stuff. You want to hear more from me? I know it. Yeah. <laughs> take care, team. Thank we'll you. see you later. Thank you.